Uh, welcome everybody to the let me bang the gavel first September 15 2021 regular meeting of the Imperial Beach City Council Planning Commission Public Financing Authority Housing Authority and Imperial Beach Redevelopment Agency successor agency and calling the meeting to order council members and staff please mute yourselves and when speaking at the proper time please announce your name I want to welcome everyone to our regular meeting on September 15th, 2021, and thank everyone for their patience and understanding as we continue to improve our teleconference meeting process. This meeting must comply with Executive Order N29-20-N-08-21 and all other provisions of state law. And now the city clerk will announce the public, I'm sorry, public comment process. This is City Clerk Kelly. Members of the public are encouraged to submit their comments for any item on the agenda now via email to comments at imperialbeachca.gov as no breaks will occur between agenda items. Please note in the subject line the item on the agenda that you wish to comment on. Specify if you would like your comment to be read aloud or just to be entered into the record. Written comments will be read by the city clerk or staff for up to three minutes. Public comments will be accepted until the mayor announces that public comment for that item is closed. For providing oral comments during this meeting, join Zoom by computer, mobile phone, app, or dial, or the dial-in number. The meeting details are located on the first page of the agenda. Members of the public will not be shown on video. You will be able to speak when called upon. When it is the appropriate time, use the raise hand feature on the computer or mobile phone app, or if dialing in, press star nine on your telephone. Public comments will be limited to three minutes so that business can be efficiently completed at the meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now City Court Kelly, please take the roll. Council Member Aguirre. Aguirre is here. Council Member Leva Gonzalez. Leva Gonzalez here. Council Member Fisher. Fisher here. Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs. Spriggs here. And Mayor Dedina. Dedina here. Great. Um, and now Fire Chief French will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Mayor, I believe I inadvertently forgot to um, check the roll for Council Member Fisher. Council Member Fisher, are you here? Fisher here. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Sorry, everyone, I had a technical breakdown. Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, Mayor. Sorry, I last time I logged down to the meeting. Okay, um, and now we have the re reimbursement disclosure reports on assignments and activities and committees. And uh, if you take it away, Council Member Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, September 2nd, I, uh, along with MTS staff, delivered uh, 5,000 pronto cards to uh, students within the Sweetwater Union High School District in partnership with Superintendent Aguirre. Uh, these will be distributed for students in need uh, of high schools uh, within the system, including Mar Vista High. Um, I also wanted just to quickly flag that tomorrow the MTS Board of Directors will reconvene um, and there will be an item that is of relevance and importance to residents in Imperial Beach who take the trolley and the bus. We will be considering a development project for housing at the Palm Trolley Station where there it might have parking implications along other types of implications. So I highly encourage everybody to attend tomorrow's MTS board meeting, which starts at 9 a.m. And just want to remind everybody that September continues to be uh, ride MTS for free with your Pronto card or your Pronto application. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks. And thanks for mentioning the Palm Avenue project. I'm hoping there's room for the Palm Avenue trolley chicken that uh, hangs out in the parking lot. 
Uh, we've talked about that at Sandag meetings. So uh, thank you. That's a great project, by the way. Really, really great. Um, Council Member Leva Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have nothing to report on for committees, but I just like to make a couple announcement of some uh, some uh, functions that are happening in the city this particular weekend. So Saturday, um, the coastal cleanup sponsored by I Love a Clean San Diego. Um, we'll be having two separate locations where you can come on out, volunteer, and help clean up this beautiful city that we live in. The first location, the alley west of the Burger King on 12th and Palm Avenue, and then the second location in District 4, the alley behind the 7-Eleven and 13th and Ivy Boulevard. The, uh, the time range is, is fully accommodating everybody's schedule on a Saturday, so it's from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., the second activity on that Saturday is the third annual IBAC um, Horseshoe Tournament, which is being held on the beach in between Elm Street and the pier. If you'd like to sign up, you can sign up on Saturday from 7.30 a.m. to 8.45. And then lastly, on Sunday, the IB back, um, Active Community Walk, Ride, and Roll is on Sunday from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., and it begins at Bikeway Village and it does a loop. It comes south on 13th, makes a ride on Ivy Boulevard, a ride on Seacoast, a ride on Palm, then it ends up back onto the Bayshore Bikeway and it ends back up at the um, Bikeway Village. Um, so that's all I have. Thank you very much. Really looking and hoping a lot of our residents um, participates in some of these uh, activities that we have going on this weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Fisher. Thanks, Mayor. Good evening to everybody joining us by way of Zoom or, or other media. Um, I just uh, wanted to report that on Monday, I joined the uh, Sun Coast annual meeting that was held down at Luigi's Pizzeria. Had a great time, 70 plus attendees. They had raffles from local vendors and uh, really talked about the how grateful they are to the city and uh, the support they've felt from not only the uh, city staff, but from members of the city council. And they're really hoping to find a suitable location in the near future, but they're continuing to increase their membership. They're doing lots of uh, walking through neighborhoods. They're at the uh, Artisan Fair on Saturdays. They have a small table there, but uh, they're, they're, they're looking great and feeling good about uh, their partnership with the city and the support they receive. So thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and my apologies um, for uh, reverting back to the old, uh, the old, uh, zoom background and everything my um somehow my office uh city laptop um uh, wasn't working so i'm gonna have to uh get some it support for that um the uh on last uh, thursday um and then again this monday and again today uh i've been in very intensive meetings with the uh uh coastal cities Delegates, delegates to the uh, Sea Level Rise Working Group, statewide Sea Level Rise Working Group, and uh, we've been basically trying to trying to um, uh, uh, put together a document and edit a document that's been going back and forth between us and coastal staff uh, that will deal with a phased approach to sea level rise planning, something that's much more um, palatable to local communities and that could provide us a lot more flexibility so that one size doesn't have to fit all from the standpoint of the Coastal Commission. And uh, we're getting to sort of where the rubber meets the road now in terms of this, uh, the, the uh, areas of disagreement. And uh, this Friday, we'll have our, our working group meeting where we're gonna look at these uh, various versions of this document uh, uh, with the, uh, the working group that includes Coastal Commissioners and Coastal Commission staff uh, and County uh, Commissioners as well. Uh, so it'll be a very interesting uh, discussion. And uh, I just got out of our last uh, meeting uh, just a couple minutes ago. And uh, I, I can say that we've really got our, our hands full. We've been working for about two years on this, on, on this collaboration or this working group. Um, and um, We've tried to find areas of common agreement. Uh, and uh, I think we're getting to the point now where uh, we're gonna have uh, some uh, choppier surf uh, to deal with. 
Um, the, um, the league conference is next week from Wednesday through Friday. And I just made the decision today that I'm, I'm not going to be attending because of COVID concerns. There are going to be upwards of 2,000 people. Uh, normally there's about 4,000, but a lot of others have the same concern. Uh, the conference is in Sacramento at the convention center. And uh, I'm now in my seventh month after my second vaccine, uh, Pfizer vaccine. And um, by all the studies that are available, uh, you know, my immune situation is not all that strong. So I'm, I'm not gonna subject myself to that risk. Um, and um, I've asked that uh, since Andy and Tyler are going, I've asked that they attend the sessions that I otherwise um, would, have, uh, would have attended. That's it, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, appreciate it. Thanks for the update. Um, and all the good work with the league as well, though. We do appreciate it. All the good work on sea level rise and coastal planning. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to just thank, I, on Saturday morning, I attended the uh, really moving 9-11 uh, ceremony organized by Chief French um, and uh, was in attendance there with city staff as well as um, our lifeguards, firefighters, obviously, and our sheriff. So that was really nice, simple ceremony. Um, and then I just wanted to make an announcement that um, thanks to, we had a meeting with Chris Ward, took him out in the, our assembly member, Chris Ward, uh, uh, Chris Helmer, our environmental director, and I took him out in the field uh, last month for a nice tour, and then talked a lot about our needs in terms of parks and rec, as well as housing, um, and issues related to water quality. But that was augmented by a, a good article in the UT talking about uh, the issues we were facing with parks and rec. And so he had just let me know um, recently that he was able to put half a million dollars in the, uh, the budget for this year that will be signed off by the governor uh, for our veterans park improvements. So I thought that was really nice. And Andy, I, I wanted to thank our city manager. Literally when I called him up to say, they've asked for a turnaround and proposal like in a day, um, he was able to get that immediately um, and including uh, the money for the splash cut. So. Uh, I think that's really nice because we just discussed this as a council. So I want to thank our city manager and city staff for working on that immediately, but also Assembly Member Chris Ward, who was very sympathetic to our, our needs. Uh, and so, and to all of you for being really supportive of, of you know, improving that park. So that's that's good news. And with that, unless there's any other anything else, I will turn it over to communications from staff. And I know I've been a lot of communication about the peers, I'm sure all of you, and Andy will give that update. Thank you, Mayor. This is Manager Hall. Um, we will probably, I'll start with the peer update and then we'll turn some time over to our human resources analyst, uh, Moranos, for some introductions of some staff accomplishments. I just wanted to let everybody know that the latest we have heard on the peer is that the port is conducting some structural analysis on the peer. Um, there is some very high surf right now, so it might take a few days to get that done. Uh, they think that the pier could be closed for up to two weeks. It's going to be difficult this week to get to get in and assess the if there's any additional damage. Uh, maybe in way of explanation, um, one of the pilings or the posts that hold up the pier came loose, and it was in the surf zone. So one of the things we don't know of is if that piling moved around and made contact with any of the other pilings and made them loose, or if there's any other damage that may have occurred. One piling in and of itself is not a structural concern on our pier. Our pier is very is a, a very well structured pier, um, but when the pilings start moving around and when they could have uh, made damage to some of the other pilings, uh, that's why they just want to make sure that they check it out, and make sure it's safe before we allow people to uh, go back on the pier. Uh, we've had a long history of pier and pier damage in Imperial Beach, and we just want to make sure that everyone's safe. So as we learn more, we'll make sure to keep everyone updated on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all those other um, social media platforms that I have no idea what I'm talking about. But we will try to educate people and, and keep them up to date as much as we can. And we, one of the things we've seen is an outpouring of concern from the public and from, uh, from users, visitors of the pier, everyone in the South Bay. Uh, we find out just how important and just how iconic the pier is to Imperial Beach. And so uh, we really appreciate the comments that we've received and we'll get that pier open just as quick as we can. So with that, Mayor, I'll turn some time over to um, our Human uh, Resources Department and Nadia Moreno to give a quick presentation. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council members, as well as staff, um, city staff. This is Human Resources Analyst Moreno, and I am here today to present the employee accomplishments from 2020 and 2021. Next slide. slide. So the city has a tuition reimbursement program uh, whose purpose is to, uh, for the professional growth of the employees through the education and to meet the present and future needs of the city, as well as to increase the skill set uh, of the employees and knowledge and to increase the effectiveness of the organization. The benefit consists of a maximum of $1,000 in tuition reimbursement per fiscal year. However, it may exceed uh, the $1,000 limit with an approved career plan in place. Next slide. So with regards to eligibility, uh, all regular permanent full-time employees are eligible and part-time employees are also um, eligible through their corresponding department budget. The eligible expenses consist of uh, tuition, registration, and class fees, as well as parking fees and required textbook software and materials for the coursework. Next slide. And now I will be presenting the class of 2020 and 2021. Next slide. From the Community Development Department, we have Associate Planner Reina Ayala, who obtained her master's degree in planning and city planning from San Diego State University. Next slide. Building official Shane Wagner, who became a certified building official by the International Code Council. Next slide. From the finance department, we have account clerk technician Christine Wiesman, who completed the Supervisors Academy through the Government Training Agency. Next slide. From the fire department, we have firefighter paramedic Henry Yorba, who completed the fire apparatus driver operator 1A and 1B through Miramar Community College. Next slide. We also have Fire Captain Jason Bell, who obtained the Chief Fire Officer Certification from the State of California. Next slide. And from the Public Works Department, we have <clears throat> Maintenance Work Christopher Johnson, who completed the Qualified Applicator Certificate through the California Department of Pesticide Regulation. Next slide. Also, Maintenance Worker 2, Kyle Henderson, who as well completed the Qualified Applicator cert Certificate through the California Department of Pesticide Regulation and also completed the Water Efficient Landscaper Certification. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> Grants and Facility Supervisor Garth Larson, who as well completed the Qualified Efficient Landscaper Certification and a Project Management, management Certification through Cornell University. Next, next slide, please. From the Public Works Department as well, we have Assistant Public Works Director Juan Larios, who completed the Supervisor Academy through the Government Training Agency. Next slide. From the Marine Safety Department, we have, um, although I don't have pictures of the two employees, uh, we have Marine Safety Lieutenant Trevor Spence, who completed the Fire Instructor One certification and the Supervisors Academy through the Government Training Agency. Also, Marine Safety Sergeant Adam Wright, who completed the Fire Instructor One certification and the American Red Cross Emergency Medical Response Instructor certification. Next slide, please. And from the City Manager's Department, we have uh, Assistant City Manager Erica Cortez Martinez, who obtained a Master's of Public Administration with an emphasis in state and local government through Southern Utah University. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I, I, oh. And this is Assistant City Manager Cortez. Nadia felt uncomfortable introducing herself, so I will do so. And Nadia Moreno, Human Resources Analyst, who also completed Supervisors Academy through the Government Training Agency. Congratulations to Class 2020-21. Nadia, I'll let you conclude your remarks. Thank you, Erica. And that concludes my presentation. That is the class of 2020 uh, and 2021. We're very happy and proud of all of our employees. And we hope that this benefit 
it continues to be utilized uh, so that we can better serve our public. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments from, from council colleagues? I think it's fantastic that we have this program and that employees are taking advantage of it. And I am super proud of each and every one of them uh, for, for this accomplishment. It takes a lot of work to get these certificates and, uh, and degrees. And um, it's all in the interest of a, a better city government, uh, our public benefiting more, and each of you having something nobody can take away, which is more knowledge and, and, and more on your resume. So congratulations. Any other comments? I'll just echo that uh, same. I'm so proud of each and every one of you for all your hard work and for always striving to be better professionals. We are so appreciative of your efforts and very proud of you. Anybody else? Yeah, you know, I think this is just an amazing part. You know, I don't think I've been so excited for staff report in a long time, uh, but to see all these smiling faces and people who have really improved their lives with the help of the city. But, you know, more importantly, they're, they're doing it for themselves and for their family and the city is able to assist them. So I, I applaud them for their efforts, for the time and the, the sacrifice they put into to improve uh, their job skill set, which ultimately helps the residents of Imperial Beach. Anybody else? All good. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Oh. Um, just to piggyback um, everyone else on the council, their comments. Um, my comment is, as long as these individuals do not leave Imperial Beach, they are they need to stay here. Do not think about going anywhere, please. Um, thank you very much. Great, thanks. No, Nadia, thanks for that update and congratulations to all the staff. Um, really great program. Um, two things. First, I think we have an Ivy League grad because I think Cornell, isn't Cornell, anybody know that if Cornell's an Ivy League school? I think it is. So that's amazing. <laughs> and then um, just on a personal, I've known Adam Wright since he was seven years old and I taught him when he was, I was, he was my student at uh, uh, Harborview Elementary back before it was Ivy Elementary and I was my first job out of college. Um, but I also took a, an emergency medical response class from him, and he was an outstanding teacher. Absolutely fantastic. So it's nice to see him get that certification. But we've got some really talented staff, and it's really great to see everybody move forward. And uh, thanks to our city council and our staff for approving that, that program. So with that, thank you again, Nadia, and congratulations. And now we are going to move on to, unless there's anything else, uh, move on to public comments. This is City Clerk Kelly. I will begin with members of the public participating through Zoom. Members of the public, if you would like to speak on this um, on, under public comments, please use the raise hand feature on your computer or phone app. If you're calling in, press star nine on your telephone. And um, Mr. Mayor, um, I believe Kevin Rasmussen is donating time to um, Nick Klein. Is that okay, Mr. Mayor? Well, I think I think Nick can, I think three minutes is a long time. I think the Gettysburg Address was three minutes. So, um, Nick, I think you're you're fine. If you need a little bit of more time, let us know. But I think three minutes is fine. Okay, um, Kevin does has his ra hand raised, so I will begin with him. Okay. Um, Mr. Rasmussen, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes to speak. Hello, council members. Thank you again for all that you're doing for our city. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate you raising the topic of the pier last uh, council meeting. Uh, I, as you alluded a moment ago, I do want to yield the balance of my time to Nick. I really appreciate that. That's all. Thank you. The next speaker is Becky, Becky Rapp. Ms. Rapp, please unmute yourself and begin. You have three minutes. Becky Rapp? Yes, good evening. My name is Becky Rapp. I, I recently read an article from CNN titled Schizophrenia Linked to Marijuana Use Disorder is on the Rise. As a mother and a youth group mentor, I find this very troubling as our young people today are suffering greatly from mental health issues. The fallacy they believe is that marijuana will help them with anxiety and depression and this is the message the industry has led them to believe. The CNN article points out that schizophrenia 
linked with marijuana use is up 8% from previous years. Schizophrenia is a chronic, severe, and dis disabling mental disorder. Its symptoms include delusions, thought disorder, and hallucinations. There is no cure. Other negative effects of marijuana use are poor cognitive function, suicidal thoughts, and plans and attempts of suicide. As young people's brains are still developing, they are primarily affected. The industry is preying on our young people, hoping to create lifetime users without considering the effects this drug will have on them. The industry has a surpitious way of marketing and advertising their product, portraying a message of health. When I ask my youth regarding their perception of marijuana, they answer without hesitation that it's safe that our government wouldn't legalize something for recreational use without it being so. I highly recommend that you ask staff to analyze the scientific data and ask that you focus on the mental health crisis we are facing with our young people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other members of the public that would like to speak via Zoom? Okay, we have Nick Klein. Mr. Klein, please identify yourself and begin. You have three minutes. Uh, just for clarification before I start, Dina did say I do get more than three minutes of Kevin's time. No, you, you have three minutes. But you said that I could have more if needed, right? If you needed it, but I, I think three minutes is fine. Yeah, I think, I think I will need it. Thank you for that. Well, I we'll am a United States citizen resident of IB Nick Klein, June 9th, 2019. When our public fishing pier opened, the back of the pier was closed to fishing to allow the restaurant to spread out. About nine oversized picnic tables from the park below had been placed there by the city to let the restaurant to spread out. This wasn't allowing the restaurant to spread out. It doubled their seating capacity while ending fishing at the same time. Up until today, COVID is still being cited as excuses that we can't fish back there. The restaurant itself doesn't even follow COVID standards of six feet spacing and in fact has rearranged and jammed their personal tables as close as possible, well below that distance in the past few days. So let's stop using that as an excuse going forward, please. Many other excuses have been used. Fishermen are dirty, don't follow rules, criminals, and most recently, we are now labeled as sexual predators by our mayor. No one knew it was even a code not to cut bait except in designated areas until COVID began. We promptly made requests for cutting boards to be installed along the rails that only stick out two inches and are six inches long about every 20 feet. We ask that signs be posted about the code for cutting bait in designated areas. Live streaming cameras be installed at the back of the pier to feed directly to the city website for anyone to view, thus deterring any negative behaviors. Patrols of lifeguards on the pier or any patrols, fish and game or parks and rec or police outpost at the bottom of the lifeguard tower. We want metal low pressure hoses to be installed at the bottom of each sink so that we can rinse off our fishing areas as needed. Because after all, all, all boat launch areas have free water spigots to clean rich people's boats. We ask for better cleaning of the pier because it has not been up to par during COVID for various reasons. We also organized a fisherman's led pier cleaning crew. We are proactive. Our fishermen on our pier are being targeted by our city government who found it is much easier to take fishermen's rights away on a fishing pier than it is to make lifeguards do their job of keeping watergoers safely back 100 feet from a structure in the water. Our own city leader, a surfer, wanted to surf next to our pier, so he led the charge in ending our public fishing on our public fishing pier a few years back. Now the same leader is trying to end our fishing at the back of the pier, saying we're dirty criminals and sexual harassers. Mr. Klein, your time is up. I was allowed to have more than three minutes. No, the mayor said no. He said yes if it if I needed it. Mr. And then, Klein, can you can you wrap it up in thirty seconds? I can wrap it up in about a minute and a half. Why don't you wrap it up in thirty seconds? We'll 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 compromise so we can get on with the, the meeting. 
Well, I'm a citizen. I think I should be able to finish my four short paragraphs. It's only about nine sentences. Mr. Klein, you're getting as many rights as everyone else. You've already wasted time, so um, now your time's up. Our mayor has no agenda of act. Okay, Mr. Mayor, the next speaker is Lauren. Lauren, please identify yourself and you have three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please identify yourself and begin. My name is Lauren. I'm a resident of Imperial Beach and I'm calling to strongly urge that the city require um, vaccines for all uh, city. Lauren, that's, Lauren, that's for another, that's for an actual agenda item. So if you Perfect. want to call in. I'll continue. Item. Sorry, thank you. Thank you for keeping me on track. Yeah. And I, I will say that I just support what and Lauren, it's honestly, we, we, by under law, we have to have you speak during that, that item, or you can okay, call, I'm not gonna talk about don't call it. I'll talk okay. about something else. Okay. So I just, I will just talk about the peer since I apologize for getting the topic wrong. Um, I would just like to say that I think, um, I'm glad you're going to fix the peer. That's very good. I think it should be safe for everyone. And also I feel like um, that the fishermen should have the uh, availability to fish wherever they want. Uh, I second everything that Nick Klein said. He made very valid points. Um, I do hope that um, the city council is able to come to an agreement that um, would allow people to enjoy the pier as for walking and exercise, but um, also be able to uh, be able to include the um, necessary activity of fishing to feed your family as well as fishing for recreation. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Okay, Mr. Mayor, I will now go. Oh, there is one more, Danielle Rich Richardson. Please identify yourself and begin. Hello, my name is Danielle. I'm a resident of Imperial Beach. I'm, call, I'm calling in just to remind you that I still think it's important that we have a process to hold the sheriffs accountable for their actions in this city. We discussed at length last year the importance of this, and it's becoming relevant now. I have, I'm in it, I, I have a problem that the sheriffs um, wrongly arrested and assaulted a good friend of mine, and now they refuse to um, take accountability. They refuse to apologize, and they refuse to um, take responsibility for that. And I've been trying to email them, trying to set up meetings with them, and they are refusing to talk to me. So, you know, we agreed that we were going to have open, ongoing communication with them, but what am I supposed to do when they refuse to talk to me? That's my question for you. Okay, we can't respond to public comments at this time. Um, we will receive and file your comments and someone will get back to you. Thank you, Ms. Richardson. Okay, Mr. Mayor, I will now go to written comments. There are no more raised hands. Um, the first written comment is from Indigo Curtis. And she says, good afternoon, council members. It has been over a year now since the law enforcement ad hoc committee presented their recommendations to this council. We have still seen none of their recommendations followed and no accountability, I'm sorry, accountability or open conversation with the sheriff's department. This makes the citizens of IB feel uncomfortable, unsafe and ignored. It seems that the city would prefer to wait until the sheriffs commit an egregious violation within the boundaries of Imperial Beach that reveals their capacity for corruption and violence before following the simple recommendations of experts. The top recommendation of the ad hoc committee was that the ad hoc committee be continued as well as an open dialogue that we have never had with the Sheriff's Department. When a terrible violent incident is caught on camera, the citizens will remember this council's failure to add I'm sorry, failure to act to hold these sheriffs accountable to the community in any way. 
I would also like to remind the council that Dante Pamantuan, the president of the IB Chamber of Commerce, is comfortable admitting on camera that he does not support the LGBTQ community. As a queer person, when I see our city officials, such as the mayor attending events side by side with a man who feels it is his right to refer to the pride flag as demonic and thereby LGBTQ plus community members and business owners as demonic, it makes me feel extremely unwelcome, frustrated and disgusted. Thanks for your time, Indigo Curtis. The next uh, written comment is from Matt Lezinski, and I apologize if I mispronounced your name. And he says, I would like to bring up the issue that we do not have any tennis courts in IB. I know we have land in the sports park that could fit several courts. Is there any plan to use some of the recreational money to develop courts? I am an owner in Seaside Point community with three young kids. I would love to see them grow up playing tennis here in IB. I would also like to see permanent beach volleyball courts set up in front of the Dunes Park. Beach volleyball is now a NCAA recognized sport. It would be an awesome place to see our kids play. I'm not sure if this is the best place to bring up these issues slash recommendations, but I definitely wanted to make sure our city council is considering them. I'm happy to help design and recommend locations. Regards, Matt. Hey, Kirk Kelly, can we forward that comment to our public works, uh, public parks and rec director? I know they're doing that survey, so same feedback. Sure, I will take care of that. Great, thank you. And there is, um, there are no more written comments, Mr. Mayor. Great, thanks everybody, appreciate it. And now we are going to the consent calendar, items one through five. And uh, City Clerk Kelly, before we start with any council uh, comments, do we have any public comments on that? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, there is one regarding consent calendar number three, and it's from Wynne Heskala, a resident of IB. And she says, um, resolution number 202158. I fully support the resolution citing the ongoing and unrelenting border sewage disaster. It is extremely damaging to the physical and e economical welfare of everyone in our community and the entire region. Thank you very much, Wynne Heskala. Any other um, public comments? That is it, Mr. Mayor. Great. I'm closing the public comment period now, and I'd like to entertain a motion to approve consent calendar items numbers one through five. Big so move. Is there a second? Yes, sure. Second. City Group Kelly will now take an oral roll call vote. There has been a motion by Spriggs and a second by Fisher to approve consent calendar item numbers one through five. Councilwoman Aguirre, how do you vote? Aguirre, aye. Councilmember Leba Gonzalez, how do you vote? Leba Gonzalez, aye. Councilmember Fisher, how do you vote? Fisher, aye. Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs, how do you vote? Spriggs, aye. And Mayor Dedina, how do you vote? Dedina, aye. <clears throat> Motion carried unanimously. Great, thank you. And now we have public hearing one. Marks, applicant, consideration of C uh, CUP. 21-0001 regular coastal permit um, in the CMU-1 commercial and com general commercial mix zone. And I'd like to <coughs> declare the, the uh, public hearing open and community development director Fultz will give the report. Uh, Mayor, thank you. This is community development director Fultz. Uh, staff is recommending uh, that the item be continued to the October 6th City Council meeting at 5 p.m. and that public comment will be heard at that time. That's great. Um, I just want to make sure, um, City Group Kelly, do we take an oral? Uh, do we have to entertain a motion to make that happen? Um, Correct. That right? Okay. Correct, Mr. Mayor. So I'd like to entertain a motion. So uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs, let me make sure that it's. I read out what the uh, the motion was. Okay. Sorry. I entertain a motion to continue the public hearing to the regular scheduled city council meeting on Wednesday, October 6, 2021 at 5 p.m. Now we can take your motion. I so move. Thank you. Second. Anybody got a second? I give it a second. Okay. Thank you very much. And now, City Clerk Kelly, please take a roll call vote. This is City roll Clerk Kelly. 
This is City Clerk Kelly. There has been a motion by Spriggs with a second by Aguirre to continue the public hearing to the City Council meeting of Wednesday, October 6th at 5 p.m. Council Member Aguirre, how do you vote? Aguirre, aye. Council Member Leiba Gonzalez, how do you vote? Leiba Gonzalez, aye. Council Member Fisher, how do you vote? Fisher, aye. Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs, how do you vote? Spriggs, aye. And Mayor Dedina, how do you vote? Dedina, aye. Motion carried unanimously. Now, now we are on item number one, city council discussion on direction on the employee vaccination policies. Assistant city manager Cortez will give the report. Thank you. Good evening, mayor, council, members of the public. This is assistant city manager Cortez. Um, uh, as the mayor introduced the item, this is the discussion uh, and direction on employee vaccinations and policies. I first wanna take a, a couple of minutes to thank our department heads and our employees for following procedures and adapting to all the COVID rapid changes um, while providing even you know, great services to our community and more, more for your leadership, uh, mayor and council for supporting our staff. So I just wanna clarify that this item does not contain a resolution. This is just basically staff providing information to the city council to have a discussion and then uh, at the end provide some direction to staff. Um, so the staff pair some options for discussion and consideration regarding um, employee vaccination. We researched a lot of cities, we researched policies, we made a lot of phone calls and collected data, which is uh, hopefully encapsulated uh, on this presentation. Next slide. The city adheres to these different organizations when it comes to COVID, which is the uh, CDC, OSHA, the CDPH, and obviously the San Diego Health Department. So whatever new rules and guidelines are published, uh, you know, we adhere to all those. So the information being presented to you, again, it's um, based on the latest rules and guidelines. Next slide. On August 9th, um, after meeting and conferring with our bargaining groups, the city started to collect, uh, we established a policy and the city started to collect uh, proof of vaccination. Um, as you can see on your screen, it's either the card or the QR code through the state of California. Another item would be a uh, certified letter from the employee health care provider. <clears throat> so this applied to all employees, volunteers, council members, and any uh, direct contractors that the city uh, works with. So employees had 30 days to present the proof of vaccination or provide uh, a vaccination status form. Basically the status forms gave them the options of either uh, indicating that they're not vaccinated, that they've declined, or they've had their first appointment or second appointment is scheduled. So as of September 9th, which is the date that this uh, staff report was posted, which is the deadline uh, to return um, proof of vaccination, uh, we, we have data to provide to you, which uh, any of my other presentations that I have provided in the last almost two years to the council when it comes to COVID, it's outdated. So um, these numbers will be reflected as of today. Next slide. So here you'll see that, um, apologize, I'm moving my screen here. Uh, here you'll see that the summary is a little bit different compared to what we provided to the, uh, in the staff report. Um, what we did is we broke it into four categories. We have the administration, we have the maintenance and operation, public safety, parks and rec. And just to clarify, administration just basically means anybody who works basically administrative clerical jobs at their desks. Uh, maintenance and operations are typically our public works or any of our inspectors. Public safety is comprised of fire and lifeguards and obviously parks and recreation is pretty clear. So these numbers are, uh, are updated as of today. And like I said, even um, my presentation is a little bit outdated because even this evening we continue to have cooperation from our employees and get additional proof of vaccinations. So I have three categories here. There's the vaccinated, this includes full vaccination and that they claim they've received at least their first dose. 
There's the unvaccinated. This includes those that decline to provide proof of vaccination. And then the unknown that have not had an opportunity to respond. Uh, for purposes of a, our policy, our mask policy requirement, those that are unvaccinated or unknown, um, we assume that, it, uh, for, I'm sorry, for the unknown, we assume they're unvaccinated and both categories must adhere to the mask requirement. So as you can see, the administration, 86% has been vaccinated, 8.3 unvaccinated, 5.5 is unknown. Again, these are higher numbers from what <clears throat> is presented in the staff report. Maintenance and operation, we're a little bit under 50%, 4.8% uh, uh, claim they're unvaccinated. And then we still haven't received uh, responses for uh, from 46% of the um, employees. Under public safety, we have 33% vaccinated, 7.8% unvaccinated, and then uh, this is a greater number. We have at least 58% that have not reported. But like I said, um, our employees continue to provide proof. Our um, department has taken some leadership also to remind them. Um, one of the things that I did is um, on the next slide. Is broken down to represented employees and not represented employees. And the only reason I did that is because one of the options um, indicates, which is option two, to mandate vaccinations for those that are represented and not represented. So I wanted to give you a breakdown um, so you understand where represented employees stand. We, uh, for the vaccinated is 42%, for the non-represented is um, 90%. And so, like I said, we still have at least 50% that haven't not responded. Next, next slide, please. So the question here is, can um, the city mandate employee vaccination? Short answer is yes. Employers may require employees to receive um, an FDA approved vaccination. As we know, as of August 23rd, Pfizer has been approved for a two dose vaccination. Um, as long as the employer does not discriminate against or harass employees uh, or a job applicant on the basis of a protected characteristic and that the employer provides reasonable accommodations under um, uh, religious or medical disabilities under the FIHA or ADA. So I'm gonna get into those two categories a little bit more. Next slide. <laughs> Excuse me. So medical exemptions, um, what are they? This is basically, you know, the employee asking for a, an exemption and the employee has to qualify, have a qualified disability that prevents them from receiving a, a vaccination. The employee can request a reasonable accommodation through HR and then provide all the medical and required documentation. Medical documentation is basically a certified medical certification by a healthcare provider. And then um, the last item is that that exemption will not pose a direct threat or health and safety of our employees or, um, or um, others. Next slide. The religious exemption is um, basically uh, is somebody that holds a religious belief, practice, or observance that um, refrains them from having the vaccination. The employee obviously will request a reasonable accommodation through HR. The employee also has to provide some documentation. This includes um, written material, debriefings uh, from practices and beliefs from uh, the religion, they, even a letter uh, from a religious leader that has to be certified. And again, uh, that the exemption <clears throat> does not pose a direct threat or health to any employer or others. Next slide. So I tried to encapsulate um, all the options that were provided in the staff report um, in as much as possible in, in this chart. And I will um, go over each of them and add additional 
updates that have been provided as of uh, Friday, September 9th, but the staff report was um, posted. So we have six options. Again, this is uh, a dis uh, these these were provided as options. The city council may choose to uh, go with these options, these six options, or have a different direction. Um, so the first op option is, uh, and by the way, it's going to be broken down. Whether it's the policy, what are some of the requirements that we have to abide for, and additional items to consider, and then cost. Um, Policy, it's option number one is to mandate vaccines. This would require the city to meet and confer on the impacts for um, the, the uh, union with the unions. Uh, it would also require us to include a medical and religious exemption. It's important to clarify that our current policy does not contain those. Uh, our current policy was just the purpose of collecting data and it does, it does not include any of the religious exemptions, nor does it include any uh, disciplined. Um, additional items to consider is what constitutes mandate vaccines. Uh, we know that again, FDA approved Pfizer two, two shots, but there's also discussions about the booster and um, that is highly encouraged even for those that don't have a compromised immune system. So the city staff would need direction from the city council to understand if when um, the FDA approves these boosters and deems them necessary, does it include also the boosters? Some of the costs here associated is obviously employment separation and legal costs for those that don't comply with this policy. Apologize for that, I had to grab a drink. Option number two, it's mandated vaccines for non-represented and new hires. Now, if you go back to the chart that I provided, I've um, indicated already that a big percentage of non-represented employees are already vaccinated. I believe it was about 90%. So this option may be a little bit out of the uh, out of the equation. However, um, it would uh, it would be uh, perhaps uh, for new hires or uh, new hires that are non-represented. Um, again, if it's new hires that are represented, it meet, we have to meet and confer uh, for the represented only uh, for impacts and then include the medical and religious exemptions. And then we need to understand um, from the city council if it will um, contain any disciplines. Um, the FDA, again, what, what constitutes mandate vaccines we need to understand if it includes the booster after the fda approves it what are the costs employment separation and legal for those who obviously don't comply with this policy option number three mandate vaccines or weekly negative tests now i had an asterisk there because i will towards the end um share with you some new developments um this is uh, also requires us to meet and confer uh, with their represented employees only include medical and religious exemptions and then we need to understand if um, it should include some dis discipline um, again we need uh, to understand clarification if the uh, boosters uh, shall constitute mandate and then um, this one obviously will contain a lot of impacts to production and service levels uh, the numbers have changed but um, last when the staff report was um, uh, posted, we were talking about $18,000 a week for weekly testing because we were using the unvaccinated and those that had not responded. I'm sure that number is a little bit less, but just uh, uh, so the council understands each test, PCR test is about $250. Um, and then not only that, but then we, um, we also have to pay travel to and from the medical facility. Some alternatives and options to that is perhaps try to negotiate with the medical provider a more reasonable cost, maybe use some of the federal funding um, that is available out there. There has been uh, other programs where we can also conduct a test on site. We would have to train 
staff that is highly confidential because this has to be uh, managed really confidential. Um, and perhaps that also would defer some of the costs. Otherwise, we're looking about $18,000. Um, this would probably require the city council to amend the ARPA mitigation plan for authorized reserves. Option number four is extending the proof of vaccination period for 90 days. This is where we're at now. You know, we only gave our employees 30 days to show proof of vaccination. Perhaps now that the Pfizer has been um, approved from August 23rd to the deadline where they're supposed to provide it, September 9th did not give them enough time to gain some uh, trust in the process. And um, we, may, we may be able to get a little bit more responses. Um, this obviously would require for us to amend the current policy. Um, if it does not contain any discipline, it may not require us to meet and confer. Uh, we, I, I, we would highly encourage that we include medical and religious exemptions at this time. And then, um, uh, like I said, it's probably employees would get more confidence now that the Pfizer has been approved. Uh, and then um, after the 90 days, staff can report back to the city council with additional data. Um, costs, of course, if the city council would to include discipline, this employment and legal costs, and then also um, for those that don't comply. Option number five is no change is the current status, but still continue to encourage our employees to respond to the existing policy, perhaps partner with the union groups and ask them to help us uh, get some of their members, you know, to cooperate and comply. Uh, continue to enforce the mask mandate, which is what we have in place uh, at our facilities. And um, option number six is a combination of those options. Again, this was just provided as an example, uh, but this is basically uh, letting the council that, you know, is at your discretion after you discuss and that we would just um, ask that you provide some direction. Next slide. Okay, so the new developments that I was referring to here is, um, again, when my, my staff report was posted, Biden had given a, uh, some remarks outlining his COVID-19 action plan, which includes requiring all federal employees and their contractors to be vaccinated. Um, there's certain dates per each category, uh, anywhere between November uh, December and even up to January 2022. Uh, requiring vaccination for health facilities and hospitals that participate in Medicaid. And then uh, he also uh, calls for all entertainment venues where large groups gather to require vaccination or a negative test. The four and five I've highlighted for you because that will pertain to option number three. This was um, uh, is requiring all uh, private employees, employers, sorry, that have 100 or more employees to be vaccinated or test weekly. Now, he ordered the Department of Labor and OSHA to develop a new rule and guidelines. Uh, it is anticipated that it's going to take about two to six weeks. So there will be more developments between two to six weeks that will follow, uh, specifically in the state of California. Uh, municipalities, public municipalities fall low OSHA. So although he is indicating, President Biden is indicating that it's for uh, private companies, uh, the, the likelihood of this impacting public agency is greater. So this means that it might, we will, it will apply to Imperial Beach. Um, the, the, the last item is requiring paid time off for um, those employees. Uh, for post vaccination illnesses. So if they have any side effects that they have some time off with loss of compensation, without loss of compensation, apologies. Next slide. So again, the um, staff try to present uh, as much as possible details in comparison with San Diego County um, uh, overall, I checked right before the meeting, uh, as of today, no, no agency in San Diego County has mandated 100% vaccinations 
uh, San Diego, city of San Diego has um, uh, announced it, but they are still in the meeting confer process. Nothing has been confirmed. Um, and then we heard Encinitas and Coronado doing man mandate vaccines or weekly testing. So um, tonight, what staff's recommending is that the city council evaluate all the information that we have presented, uh, have a discussion, provide direction to staff. If you uh, are to require additional information, we're happy to provide that. And then also um, you have the option to just continue the item to a future meeting. Uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Assistant City Manager Cortez. Um, and thanks for all, it's a lot of information, a big grid. Um, before we go to council questions, maybe we could just go straight to public comment, to, uh, get that done with. Um, do we have any public comments, uh, City Clerk Kelly? Yes, Mr. Mayor, um, we have three raised hands. Um, we'll begin with David Garcias. David, please unmute yourself and begin. You have three minutes. Hi, uh, my name is David Garcias. Um, I am uh, a representative for SEIU Local 221. And uh, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, SEIU's goal is, has been, uh, and continues to be universal vaccinations. And thanks to the dedication of members and many SEIU leaders across the country, more than four out of five working people united in SEIU have chosen to take the vaccine to protect themselves, their family and their communities. Together, we can make sure that everyone, black, white and brown are protected from COVID-19 virus and that we can end this global pandemic. Now we have been leading the way in vaccine distribution efforts in our communities that are built upon equitable outreach and education, increased access and basic supports and protections. As employers and state leaders release working workplace vaccination mandates, we wanna make sure that there is paid time off to take the vaccine um, some type of compensation uh, for their time uh, and also being uh, working in hazardous conditions and a seat at the table to ensure that all working people are respected, protected and paid fairly as we continue to work together to fight COVID-19. So SEIU is in support of uh, vac universal vaccinations, but we also want an opportunity to sit at the table to be able to talk about exemptions in the event of religious or medical uh, issues. And we want to have a safe workplace. And uh, we believe that uh, we want to make sure that, um, you know, it is safe to work there. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks, you. David. Appreciate it. The next speaker is Lisa. Uh, please identify yourself. You have three minutes. Hello, my name is Lisa Thomas. I'm a resident of Imperial Beach. Uh, I'd like to uh, start by saying, you know, I encourage you to tread lightly regarding mandating the COVID-19 vaccinations for our city staff. Uh, as I'm sure you're aware, there are open positions within some of our departments which have gone unfulfilled for quite some time here in our city. Mandating vaccinations could possibly add to the deficit we already have in place. We all know the city of Imperial Beach does not offer top dollar for our public services and our staff. Our city staff serves our community out of the love for our city and its residents. Potentially jeopardizing that is a very dangerous path to start going down. We are the land of the free because of the brave. When the United States De Declaration of Independence was signed, loyal Americans were of one mind to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Our national and our local government have no right to impede on any of the above. It is the choice of every American to freely choose if they want to be vaccinated or not. It's not up to any of our governmental agencies to take away the freedom of choice. 
mandating vaccinations may have severe repercussions greater than protecting one's own choice of health from potentially losing some of our great staff members to potentially harming their life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I fear that if we mandate, mandate vaccinations and one of our staff falls gravely ill or worse, perishes, the city will have a massive wrongful death lawsuit on its hands. Also, I want you to think about the repercussions of the wrongful termination. These are very real situations that our city will face if you decide to mandate vaccinations for anyone. Again, I encourage you to tread lightly on mandating vaccinations. I also encourage you to allow free adult Americans to be free to make their own choice about their health, well-being, and vaccination status. Please. Don't take what I've just said lightly. Choose option number five. It seems to be the lesser of the evils. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Lauren. Lauren, please unmute yourself. You have three minutes and identify yourself, please. Hello, my name is Lauren. I am a resident of Imperial Beach. I'm calling to say as a healthcare worker, the last year and a half has been challenging. It has included the tragic death after tragic death of watching my community members die as they struggle to breathe. Now that there's a vaccine available, you think things might lighten up. You think that um, there will be less people at the hospital and things will be better, but that is not the case. Healthcare workers have given everything that we have um, to our community and we are tired. Tired because more people are not. Um, getting vaccinated. I want to encourage the city council to mandate the COVID vaccine to protect its citizens. If the last year and a half has shown us anything, COVID is not going away. This virus is tenacious. I will lose any faith I have in this council to do the right thing if the city does not mandate the vaccine without religious exemptions. Um, because the um, the vaccine is is will run rampant. If not, if there are not 100% people vaccinated, with only 33% of the public safety being vaccinated, how can the police and fire provide public safety if they can unknowingly spread this deadly disease to vulnerable people? This vaccine has nothing to do with religion. It has everything to do about um, protecting the community of IB. You cannot spray the COVID away, unfortunately. I would like to con uh, commend the Recreation Department for having a 100% vaccine rate. Um, we need to use this as an example for other departments and let Imperial Beach be an example to other people by showing how successful mandating vaccines can be. Um, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Um, the next speaker, Mr. Mayor, is Leonard. Leonard, please um, unmute yourself. Oh, where did you go? Okay. Please unmute yourself. Identify yourself. You have three minutes. Leonard? Leonard? Please unmute yourself and begin. Thank you. Okay, I see that he unmuted himself and then he remuted himself. Um, Leonard, would you like to speak, please? Yes, Go I'm ahead. sorry. I'm sorry about that glitch there. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank I, you. I, I apologize. And I'll be under three minutes, including that glitch. Um, I would endorse the option number five for the reasons that were already stated. Um, the uh, the healthcare practitioner that just spoke, uh, there's many other health practitioners that are uh, as adamantly opposed to the vaccination for, for many reasons. So we won't get into all that, but uh, for anyone that's really digging into this information, there are definitely two camps. And I, I would I would just recommend to the council that because this is such a divisive issue, be it because it is being fleshed out in so many other communities, I just don't see the there's no urgency that I see in the staff report that indicates that there's an there's a specific problem to Imperial Beach. I, I do understand it is a political hot potato, but there is nothing that shows that this is a crisis in IB, thank thankfully. So 
Uh, I would say just regroup a little bit, let some of the other items play out. Uh, this will be contested in the Supreme Court. There's a lot of issues with some of these mandates that are coming through with the federal government that still have to flesh out. So save your money. I think, um, uh, I think it's an issue that shows even by your own staff report that 50% of the people while your staff indicated that they didn't have the opportunity to report. My guess is they did have the opportunity. They deliberately did not want to report because they feel this is an overreach by government and overreach by politicians. So just kind of bear that in mind and, and uh, cut me off as soon as I'm done. But there are, there are a lot of downsides to pursuing this aggressively. Anything that good for you shouldn't be that hard to sell. Um, and I think people are much wiser for themselves, for their own health, to make their own decisions. So um, I just ask, ask you to take option five, not because you want to avoid the issue, but I don't see any real upside to it for our city based off our budget and resources. I uh, appreciate your time. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I have um, no raised hands, um, but I do have some written comments. So I will begin with Sandra Brillhart. She's a resident of Imperial Beach and she says, Government plays an important role in protecting the health of its constituents and is responsible for ensuring that their employees and the people with whom they interact are safe. Vaccinations are one of the most effective public health strategies to save lives and promote good health. The percentage of IB employees who remain unvaccinated despite the overwhelming evidence that vaccines are safe and effective is troubling and threatens the well-being of other employees and the general public. Unless an employee has a legitimate, a legitimate medical or religious reason for which reasonable accommodation can be granted, council should require all employees to be vaccinated by a specified date in the not too distant future. Respectfully, Sandra Brillhart. The next written comment is from Wynn Heskela, a resident of Imperial Beach. And she says, dear staff, please have the following comments read into the record. Um, number one, memo attached regarding report, report vaccination of city employees. Okay, she says, thank you for considering the issue of vaccinations for city employees. Obviously, it is not an easy or uncomplicated one. My husband and I are vaccinated and would very much like to see everyone do the same. It seems to be the best way out of this pandemic. Even though I am certainly pro-vaccination, I do not believe it should be mandated for the employees for the following reasons. One, mandates would be too expensive to administer and track. Voluntary reporting of vaccination status should be continued. To my knowledge, there is no quote official form of proof of vaccination. Two, likewise, any form of regular testing would be expensive to administer and track. And at this point, I am still hearing slash reading different things about the availability and accuracy of such testing. Three, even if those issues are overcome, mandates would inflame divisiveness within the workplace and out into the community. The issue, unfortunately, has become more emotional than logical, and any mandate could exacerbate that divide. Four, it seems the only way anything mandatory should be considered is if the majority of the employees request it for their own safety. And five, Ideally, it would be nice to know who is vaccinated and who is not when one is out and about in the community, but I cannot envision any system that could make that identification without again creating discriminatory and inflammatory situations. Things like armbands or worse come to mind. Totally unacceptable. It seems that continuing education to those who are resisting vaccination for whatever reason about the efficacy of the vaccine and the unfair exposure to the vulnerable in our community, i.e. young children and who still cannot be vaccinated themselves, elderly, immune suppressed, could be the best approach to the issue. For the record, we are both old in our household. One of us has an immune suppressed issue and now we have a new baby in our extended family. I am certainly certainly pro-vaccination, but I oppose making it mandatory for city employees. Thank you for your consideration of this difficult issue and your service to our community. Wynn Heskela. The next message is from Dr. Hans Bursch, and he says, 
Dr. Hans Bursch, 25 year resident and elder of Imperial Beach, fully supports COVID vaccine requirements for all city staff if they work anywhere with public contact. That includes the sheriff deputies, the firefighters and emergency responders. The scientific and medical data are overwhelming. Plus it guarantees our freedom to life and those of others. Get the shot. Thank you for your attention, Hans. The next message is from Anna Webb. And she says, I support the recommended vaccination policy for city employees, including lifeguards, especially for those that have public contact. Now is not the time to become lax with the COVID-19 variants spreading quickly. We need to stay vigilant so we can come out of those safe, of those safe and healthy. Anna Webb. And the last comment is from Leonard, but I believe he spoke. Yes, he spoke. And Mr. Mayor, that is the final comment. Great, thank you. Um, I have a clarification just to make sure I'm clear. City Assistant City Clerk, I mean, Assistant City Manager Cortez. Um, you know, I, even as a coach, I had to get a proof of a TB test. Do we have a vaccination requirement now with other, other through via other diseases, all the standard ones we've been getting since childhood for city employees? Uh, Mayor, Assistant City Manager Cortez, um, depending on the position, um, I'm gonna use lifeguards, for example, especially with the water quality. <clears throat> we um, provide the hepatitis and the TB. Uh, however, we do have an exemption. Same thing with our sewer department. We do provide the hepatitis and the TB, but we do uh, provide an exemption for those two classifications that have more greater exposure. For any of our all other employees, uh, when um, necessary, we provide HEP, TB, flu shots, and, and anything, but it's it's not mandated. Okay, great. Thank you. And so um, we can start with, uh, since Councilman Rigueri started, with the reports, we can start with council member Spriggs. You wanna go ahead? Just to be clear, we're, we're not taking a vote on this. We're just giving direction. Is that, is that right? Mayor, this right, is Manager Cortez. That is correct. It's just okay. uh, an opportunity for the city council to have a discussion and provide direction to staff. Great, thank you. Council member, I'm Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs, go ahead. Sure, thank you. Um, uh, Assistant City Manager Cortez, could you put up the options slide again? Yeah, okay. Um, just, I'd like to start off with just asking for a clarification on option four. Um, is 90 days, uh, there's something magical or, or uh, about the 90 days, could it be 60 days? Could it be uh, some other period subject to extension? There's a reason I am asking that question that I'll get into in just a minute. Council Member Spriggs, there is no magical day that was just uh, suggested. Uh, again, if the, the council um, may choose 30, 60, 90, 120, uh, it, going by the 90 days and what the announcement of, again, not knowing that Biden had provided this announcement uh, it kind of correlates of uh, any rule that would be published by OSHA or DOL uh, on these 90 days, because this is kind of going along with the federal government is doing, which is the November, December um, right. dates. That's, that's, that's one of the considerations I had in mind is what is the rulemaking period uh, so that uh, these issues get... Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs, you're we're, you're breaking up. I don't know if you have to reconnect, and but you know it's hard to hear you. All right, I'll sit a little closer to the go. microphone. Is this better? Perfect. So, yeah, I, one of the considerations uh, I think here is what is the uh, larger environment uh, that we are operating in that will have an influence on the willingness of our staff who. Uh, are hesitant, uh, as well as the legitimacy of any mandate that we would decide on. And the larger environment is a function of a number of things. One is the continuation without uh, diminution of the Delta variant problem. 
Another is federal rule and if and also state and county rulemaking and, and in response to the um, the Delta variant and its uh, impact. Um, another is how <clears throat> what do we know about our staff in, in, in terms of their specific views and one of the things I would like to urge us to consider is taking a little bit more time that's why I asked about the 90 days um, so that our human resources staff can get an understanding of what each employee's position is who has not responded to the request. That's the only way it seems to me that we're going to know what the, uh, and, and as the situation evolves, the rulemaking, the general environment, more other uh, lo uh, local governments uh, grappling with this issue, uh, et cetera. This whole, this whole stagecoach is going to move down the road uh, beyond where it is now. And I, I think I agree with the, uh, a couple of the comments, public comments made that while we are in a COVID crisis, we, there's lots of reasons for us to not feel that we have to do something right now uh, in terms of changing our policy specifically to make, to create a vaccine mandate. Um, I, I think we have to be um, sensitive to the impact on employees and what it's going to mean for our city, what it's going to mean for employment, uh, et cetera. Uh, now, obviously, <laughs> we want our staff to be safe. And when they're all back working in the office, the only way they can really be safe, yeah, masks are good, ventilation is good. But for everybody to be vaccinated is best. No, there's no question about that. I don't think even people who don't like the vaccine would have to admit that if everybody's vaccinated, there's less worry about getting COVID. I mean, that's just that's just logic. Um, the issue of the public public safety staff that have close encounters with the public is probably as close as a no-brainer as we're going to get. The whole definition of public safety is you're doing, you're helping the public be safe, not risking the public getting COVID that you might be carrying un, un, unbeknownst to yourself quite innocently. But if you're not vaccinated, the chances of that happening are much greater. So I think there are a lot of things for us to consider. Um, I've been vaccinated, and as I said in my remarks earlier, uh, I'm seven months into it now. I really probably should get a booster before I am around a lot of people, uh, but I'm looking forward to that happening so that I can confidently uh, uh, do my work here in the city with the public, as well as go to conferences, meetings, uh, et cetera. Um, so I'm looking forward to that day, and I would hope that we would all see this as doing something for the public. And even if you're worried about being vaccinated, if, even if you think this is about individual rights, think about the people that you interact with. Um, our kids are all vaccinated for the most part, unless there's a religious uh, or health exemption. Um, when you travel abroad, you have to get vaccinated to go to certain countries against certain diseases. This is all not politicized. There's no questions about it. It's to protect yourself and to protect other people. And so you don't have to go into quarantine when you come back from Kenya or wherever there might be, you know, something you need to get vaccinated against. So uh, to me, we have to just think about our own health and the health of our community and the health of our employees and our ability to work collaboratively and effectively and get off of this darn Zoom thing and back to work together, you know, as, as colleagues, et cetera. And it's the same with all of our staff. 
So I think the sooner we can move to some sort of progressive uh, effort beyond where we are right now, the better. But I don't think we're ready right now. I think we need to know more about our staff's views, more about what other cities are doing. It, in a way, I'd like, to, and I'll close by saying, in a way, I'd like to almost see examples of different cities or towns and what they're doing under each of these options. Uh, I think that would be helpful for us to um, get a sense of how they're grappling with them. I don't mind Imperial Beach being in the lead on any, in any number of areas, and we are, but I'm not so sure that this is an area that, uh, where we wouldn't benefit by having San Diego and some other places be on the bleeding edge uh, rather than us. And believe me, I think we need to move as quickly as we can, but we need to be aware of the consequences and we need to make sure that uh, when we make a decision, we have a better idea than we do right now what the impact is gonna be on staff. So those are, those are my comments, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fisher. Yeah, you know, I want to just echo it, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs on, on, you know, we were very aggressive and, and very forward, most cities of getting testing sites and, uh, you know, during the early parts of COVID and get some precautions in place. And I applaud the mayor and the rest of the city staff and the, the council for doing so. But I agree, I think we, we can't be too progressive on this. Um, Assistant Manager Cortez, I have a question for you. And this is a hard one, I, I just thought about it. Um, do we have any statistics on vaccinations over the past 90 days and the increase of them if they if they've been on the upswing comparative to the the previous 90 days i know that's a that's a loaded question so i'm not sure if you can answer that mr council council member fisher assistant city manager contrast speaking i just want to clarify <clears throat> is that for our employees or is that san diego county for for the county and maybe even a bigger snapshot than that if you have it yeah, unfortunately, I don't have that data with me. That's fine. Like I said, I just it just came to mind, and I wish I would have gotten the question to you earlier, so I apologize. That um, data I, does exist, though, and, and we can get it, correct? Assistant City Manager Cortez, that is correct, Mr. Spriggs. Thanks. I, I appreciate that. Um, you know, I just, I this really is a, a difficult decision um, because we feel like we're going to infringe upon some rights. We do, we do have a, uh, a staffing crisis. We can't get people hired. And I think that this, if we do any type of mandating vaccinations, then we uh, will alienate them. You know, if you look at the numbers that were presented to us this evening, um, boy, I tell you, some of the most responsive and responsible people who work for the city, for whatever reason, haven't responded to the request for, for vaccination um, proof. So we have 46% of the maintenance operation and almost 60% for public safety. Now, these are the two departments that probably have more people on the field interacting with the public than anybody else in the city. Very important. Now, my, my guess would be that, you know, they've made their decision on what they're going to do. But, you know, I think that the numbers we're looking at tonight are just perhaps a lack of, um, just follow through of, of getting their their vaccination proof in. And so, and again, those who reported uh, being unvaccinated, if I, if I did my math right, we're looking at 7% of total staff, which is, you know, pretty low in my opinion. So, you know, my recommendation would be that we, we do, you know, wait 90 days use, and then continue with the current policy, but no discipline. Uh, into that policy, we can put the religious and medical exemptions as well. And, you know, I think what we're going to see over the next 90 days are huge changes. Like uh, Erica mentioned, you know, the information that she had last Friday is obsolete on Wednesday uh, because of the things that keep changing and keep coming out. <clears throat> um, I can tell you that, you know, the sector I work in, I've seen a big change in people who have made decisions for themselves. Uh, to get vaccinated. And I think that's what we're going to continue to see as people feel comfortable, they gain confidence in the vaccinations and they see the thing. But again, you know, this is something where I feel people have the right to choose for themselves. And I know that the city has a responsibility to keep the public safe. 
And again, many of our workers are out about through the city on a daily basis. So it's important uh, that we come to an agreement on how to proceed forward this evening and the direction to give to staff. I think that, um, you know, we, we, we would never want to lose staff. We saw a great list of people earlier in our meeting who uh, we, we applauded and, and, you know, we're just so excited about, I would hate to lose any of those employees uh, because of being forced to do anything. And, and that's something we also need to consider going forward. So those are my comments. Thank you. Um, Councilor Oliver Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, the comments of um, my colleagues are, are, are right on. Um, they, they touched on some substantial points. Um, first and foremost, the word mandate it, it is a strong word. Um, it, it kind of um, gives individuals the impression that um, upon being forced to do something, individuals, that's not what we stand for. Um, we, we, we should have the ability to make decisions um, on our own behalf and not have them made for us. Um, so Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs touched on um, the sensitivity of it, which it's, it, it's immensely sensitive because for a number of different reasons, if people have not gotten vaccinated, even more so with the Delta variant, you know, being spread as it has, um, there's reasons why they've yet to, to be vaccinated. Um, me personally, I'm vaccinated and it's more of the peace of mind um, upon going out and being exposed to individuals. It makes you feel empowered and it makes you feel safer. Even though you still can technically, you know, acquire the virus, but it just makes you feel safer when you're out in public. And um, people being out in public, that's a part of us being social. We're social beings. Everyone's tired of being behind a, a, a computer screen, being on Zoom meetings. Everyone wants to get back to the normalcy of our daily lives. And um, I just personally feel that um, we need to wait some time because individuals should have that opportunity to make decisions um, when it comes to dealing with their body and, and their beliefs. So um, I, I just feel that we definitely need to give it more time. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, no doubt this is a very uh, challenging decision that we must make uh, because we want to be respectful of the civil liberties of individuals, because this is, you know, the country, the values that our country was built on. Now, that being said, we are experiencing a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Um, it's very clear, the data shows that more than 99% of um, uh, patients in the ICU um, are people who are unvaccinated. So uh, we swore a, a, a constitutional oath of office to ensure the health, safety, and welfare of our of our communities, that, of the communities that we represent. And I do believe that it starts, you know, with order in our own house. Now, um, that being said, um, I do want to be sensitive to the ever-changing um, guidelines and directions that are happening or taking place at the federal level. Uh, so I would be at this point inclined to continue the item and wait to see what kind of guidance we have from the Biden administration. Um, and I, that I hope would give uh, those who are tasked within our team, our public safety team, some time to respond on their unvaccinated or vaccinated or unvaccinated status, right? Uh, because, you know, just like those who are tasked to defend our country and the military. They've, you know, they've all had to, you know, go ahead and get the vaccine because they're defending our country. I would hope that that's the case with our team. But um, again, I wanna say, yes, I would be partial to seeing what the direction of our administration is and, um, and continue the item. 
That's it for me, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, I actually, I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm shocked by these numbers. I would hope that they're better by now. Um, I, I was gonna, expecting them to be better. Um, just for disclosure, I run a nonprofit that works in the United States and Mexico, and we have 100% compliance on vaccination. And that was brought to light by, uh, the urgency of that was brought to light by one of our oldest staff members, longest serving employees in Mexico, had a brother who couldn't get vaccinated even though he worked for the federal government and he just died. He was in his 30s. He wanted to get vaccinated and he couldn't. Um, and I, I want to commend you, Council Member Julia. You're right, it is, a vac it is a crisis of the unvaccinated, but I just want to make sure we don't have an employment crisis right now with our city. We have a 665,000 people have died in the United States from this, from this pandemic, um, probably a lot more. So uh, the death rate is 11 times greater uh, for the unvaccinated right now than the vaccinated. Um, I'm not sure about a lawsuit from somebody who may get a reaction from a vaccine. I can't imagine a lawsuit will happen if a lifeguard does CPR on somebody and gives them COVID because we hired a 19 year old anti-vaxxer as a lifeguard. Um, I'm shocked that our lifeguards don't seem to, our firefighters and sheriffs seem to be willing to be in contact with the public in close contact, making medical assists, and yet are fine not being vaccinated. I'm uncomfortable being around now our staff not wondering who's going to be vaccinated. So I, I find it shocking, um, which is why the president, I think, uh, provided that, that directive uh, recently. Um, so I guess Assistant City Manager Cortez, um, just to make sure I'm clear, do you think that OSHA, Cal OSHA is going to require public agencies to, of over 100 employees to get back, to make do vaccine mandates? Because that's what I, I wasn't clear on that when you said that. Uh, Assistant City Manager Cortez, Mr. Mayor, um, the Biden administration ordered the Department of Labor and OSHA to provide rulings. And what I had previously indicated is that um, public agencies, specifically Imperial Beach, follows OSHA regulations. So it is anticipated that uh, many uh, public agencies will be impacted by this ruling of uh, 100 employees plus. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I also want to take this opportunity really quick because I know it was referenced uh, by more than three council members and members of the public. Um, this chart is only city staff. The data on volunteers, contractors, things like that is a little bit different because this decision is on employees only. Uh, so I just want to clarify that the public safety category does not include our sheriff's department because we don't employ them. So thank you for that opportunity. Okay, good. Anyway, it, it, so it sounds like we're moving that way. I'd be willing to wait. It sounds like it's consensus because we understand that um, more than likely the federal government's going to require our employees to be vaccinated. That's what it sounds like. So, um, you know, that's where we're going. I think Councilmember Fisher, you're correct. That's, that's where we're going. There's going to be significant changes in the next two to three months. Um, and that's what it looks like going again. I would argue that we provide, you know, we're a public agency. These are employees don't work for, they don't work for themselves. They work for the, our government. So our government has a right to protect an obligation to protect our citizens. And I think the majority of our citizens are vaccinated and I think they'd be shocked. I'm sure just like me, when they saw these numbers in the newspaper, they were shocked. Um, and they probably expect a lot better from a public agency whose employees are paying, you know, taxes pay their salaries. So. We provide good benefits. We may not be the best benefits, but you know, I work in the private sector. It's the benefits that our public employees get are a lot better than people that get in the in the uh, in the private sector for the most part. So, I would hope that we can uh, move these numbers. Um, and I, you know, we're, we're not going to get back out of this this pandemic. We're going to be entering the third year of the pandemic. That's how depressing that is. And you know, it's going to take little by little increasing the numbers of vaccines. So, yeah, you know, I'm willing to wait, but I think we're going to be moving in that direction. Finally, just to make sure we're clear on the, the issue of personal liberty, the Supreme Court decided this issue in 1904, and Justice Harlan wrote, it was an overwhelming decision in favor of the government's uh, right to make people get vaccinated. It was around smallpox. 
And uh, Justice Harlan said, real liberty for all could not exist under the operation of a principle which recognizes the right of each individual person to use his own, whether in respect of his person or his property, regardless of the injury that may be done to others. The Supreme Court has ruled on this. The United States is under the rule of law. Um, so I just wanna make sure we're all clear on, uh, you know, and in terms of the founding of our country, it was General Washington that made his soldiers get smallpox vaccines, and which has helped us defeat the British. So um, anyway, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, I, I'm glad we're all on the same page about continuing this. Um, I would, the question is, uh, and Assistant City Manager Cortez, this is, this is on you as well, that this question is directed to you. When would, how often should we revisit uh, where OSHA is, where our employees are vis-a-vis -vis this chart, and whether any of the options have evolved, and what other cities fall under the different options and where they are. Is this something that we should come back to in, not, not necessarily for a decision, but for another update before we then move to a decision, uh, maybe in another month after that? I don't know. Should we come back in 30 days? Should we come back in 60 days? Um, looking at that 90 day as the time period where we would want to act on a policy no later than that, maybe sooner than that, if, if things move forward. Uh, I'm just throwing that out. I, I'd kind of like us to have a, a time frame for uh, judging how all of this is evolving, including the attitudes and perspectives of our employees. So I would say, I would start off with just suggesting maybe 30 days, we look at this again, again, for information and questions. You know, I, I would say the 90 days gives us coverage all the way through the end of the year. Um, you know, I, I think the mayor brought up a good point that if the federal government is going to require us to do this at some point, I, I think we would, again, not waste time, but I think we could address some other issues again, because if we put a lot of time and effort, city staff time, and then ultimately get overruled, um, by the federal government. So that, that's kind of where I stand. I, I see your point, uh, Ed, but I think that, you know, we, we just give a little bit more time to see how it goes. Mr. Fisher, I just think, I think Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs, you're just saying that in a month we can get a, we can get a report back to where we're at. Is that correct? I, I just want to make sure we're clear on that. Yeah, I, 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 as I understand it from my, um, my briefing session, uh, the city manager and the assistant city manager have already, are already in contact with what other cities are doing and uh, it shouldn't take too much to, uh, to include that information next time around. Uh, also, these numbers we're looking at right now in terms of our staff are going to evolve. We all know they will as people get more as, I mean, it's only been what, a week or two since the Pfizer vaccine was approved by the FDA. So it's, and pretty soon Moderna is gonna be uh, approved. So, uh, I'll, and a lot more people are gonna be vaccinated. Uh, so I, I just think, and a lot more mandates are gonna go into effect. So if somebody wants to leave here and go to a private company, they'll walk right into a mandated situation, chances are. So um, a lot of this is gonna improve. I would just like us to be able to monitor it uh, maybe in, you know, in another uh, month or so. Um, yes, uh, Council Member Fisher, I wouldn't, I'm not proposing action uh, in that time period. I'm just saying, let's, let's, let's stay on this. This is so important for our community and for our ability to come back and work as council members and city staff in a face-to-face -face environment. Uh, and the sooner we can do that, uh, the better. That, I mean, I, I wel would welcome the day when we can have open public council meetings again, but we can't really do that unless we know most of our staff are uh, immunized, and uh, we have a pretty good idea where the public stands on it as well, and whether or not we we would admit people based on their immunization status, or their uh, or their test results, or whatever. I don't know. That's that's to be determined down the road. But I foresee a situation, hopefully sooner rather than later, when we're all when we're back to business as usual. But that's going to require a, a pretty high level of immunity, which may require the uh, the inoculations to to take place. So um, anyway, I'm just saying I would like us to 
to keep an eye on this and to keep the ball moving? Yeah, so I guess it's feedback, I, I don't think it's unreasonable just to have a report, a status report in, in 30 days. Is that okay, Councilmember Fisher and Councilmember Aguirre and Edward Yeah, I, I'm okay then. I apologize to Councilman Spriggs. I misunderstood your comments. I think a report would really help us a lot. And I know that the city will gather the, the you know, numbers anyways, because I think they're working with the heads of departments. So thanks for that suggestion. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, it's no, it's, it's no problem. And I, I think uh, if it's overly burdensome to do it in, in, uh, uh, in a month and they need more time because it takes away from other matters as you quite rightly were concerned about, then, then you know, 45 days or whatever. I just think uh, because we have a small staff, uh, th that's a factor as well. But the, the foundation's already been laid the templates are already there in terms of what we need to be updated. And uh, I would hope that we could, you know, we could move forward with that. Is that okay, everyone? I'm in agreement, yes. Mr. Mr. Mayor, may I? Assistant City yeah. Manager Cortez, thank you. Uh, just, you know, because I'm the one who's going to be the, the research and I just want to understand the clarity of the direction that is being provided to staff. So our current policy says 30 days of collecting proof of vaccination. So what I am understanding from Mayor Pro Tem is, uh, Springs is additional 30 days to collect more data so we can give you more accurate numbers. And what would happen in this uh, um, uh, screen right now on this chart is that uh, optimally we would have also a percentage of the exemptions and religious um, is that accurate that we, we would include the exemptions and in religious? Yes, and I think if if you bring forward reasons why we should consider a further extension uh, to take it out to 60 or 90 days, I think we'd have a much better idea 30 days from now than we have right now. Thank you. That clarifies it. We'll definitely do that. And um, also it gives us a little bit more time, not only to work with their employees, but if there's any new developments on the federal government to come to the, back to the city council within 30 days or there soon after on the next uh, meeting scheduled. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Thanks. Are, can we move forward guys? All good, okay. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Manager Cortez and my council colleagues and all, all the people who called in. Uh, I also want to thank David Garcia from the CIU for calling in as well. I appreciate all your feedback. And uh, we'll move on to the next item. And that is item number two, discussion regarding the professional facilitation of the city council retreat and city manager hall will give the report. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This is city manager hall. As the city council knows the date of September 20th was selected for the city council's goal setting um, exercise, which we typically call a retreat. Um, and so there was some discussion about whether or not it would be advantageous to have a facilitator at that meeting to help us work through some of the items that where there may be some uh, different opinions or maybe even disagreement amongst members of the city council. Um, in order to have that facilitation at that meeting, um, we would need to postpone the meeting because the that would not leave enough time for that facilitator to meet with members of the city council, obtain some of your uh, concerns and, and get to know some of the issues that you would like to see resolved. And so if you would like to have professional facilitation at your retreat, we would need to delay that um, to a different date. So this item has been placed on the agenda so that the city council can decide whether or not you want to proceed on Monday evening or whether or not you want uh, staff to engage with a uh, consultant to uh, offer facilitation services at your retreat. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment? Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. I see that there's one raised hand and I believe it is Nick Klein. Please unmute yourself and you have three minutes, Mr. Klein. Oh, I think he disappeared. Okay, I do have one written comment and it's from Josie Hamada. 
a resident of Imperial Beach, and she says, I totally support that the city obtain a third party to facilitate the city council retreat. As a former president of a teacher's union of over 300 teachers, our yearly executive board retreat was always done by an outside firm to ensure that the topics and issues at hand were done effectively with results that were crucial for all teachers. Our staff attended just to provide the data that might be asked. Sincerely, Josie Hamada. And Mr. Mayor, that's the final um, public comment. Great, thanks. Um, we're trying to mix it up in terms of where we start. So uh, council, we can go from Councilmember Leva Gonzalez down the list, if that's okay. It's hard when we don't have the button to push. Is that, if that's okay, Councilmember Leva Gonzalez, you wanna start it off? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, my comments in regards to seeking professional um, facilitator for the council retreat, um, I don't feel that um, it's necessary for us to waste funds on an individual where grown adults need to meet and discuss things and get things resolved in a timely manner. We've prolonged having this council retreat um, numerous times. I don't have the exact number. Um, I've adjusted my schedule numerous times to accommodate individuals that were unable to attend uh prior dates so um i'm showing up on monday and i'm looking forward to discussing what needs to be discussed moving forward for the better good of this beautiful great city that we live in that's all i have thank you council member fisher yeah you know before i get started my comments i do have some clarifications for manager hall um so depending on what direction we give today, would this not make our standing uh, retreat that's on Monday uh, going for, would it still go forward? I, I'm a little confused because there was no dates attached to this regard to any existing meetings. Thank you, Councilman Fisher. This is Manager Hall. If you would like to have facilitation at your meeting, we would need to establish a new date. We would have to work in consultation with the facilitator for when they would be available to meet with the council and, and line up those calendars. Um, if the city council chooses that they don't want or need facilitation, um, the, the retreat could. Again, you, you have to have a majority of the council um, present at the meeting, but the, the retreat would uh, occur on Monday afternoon. As, as previously scheduled. Wonderful, Thank, thanks for clarifying that. I apologize for not having the, the, the clarification earlier. Um, yeah, you know, I, I echo the sentiments of Councilman Leva Gonzalez. I don't think it's needful for us to spend any, uh, any of our, our, you know, city funds, especially out of the, the general fund to, you know, help us get along. I think we've worked well getting together. I think we've tackled some tough issues in the short time that I've been on the council. I feel very comfortable uh, not having the same vision ideas uh, as my my colleagues here, but I also feel very comfortable that we can work them out and share ideas as as professional adults. And I think that's where, uh, you know, if we find that we can't get along, we get in a room and we can't get along, which I, I think that's just not going to happen. Then we need to move uh, into into a different direction. But I think that the existing uh, date for this Monday's uh, retreat should should be in full effect uh, at this time without any uh, anybody to facilitate it. Thank you. Councilmember Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and just for context, um, you know, this is an issue. I mean, the retreat itself is an item of interest of this body for quite some time. Uh, I believe uh, we had it scheduled February 14th, and then we had it rescheduled to May 20th, and then we had it rescheduled to 28th. That's when I that's when I requested it to be on consent to be considered on uh, August 18th. And uh, this was all in the context of obviously making sure that all of our calendars and schedules aligned because in the past, and for my colleagues, new colleagues on council uh, council's awareness. Um, our retreats have never needed a facilitator. We've worked very well. Um, we've had open, um, very um, engaging dialogue. As an example, actually, the last council retreat that we had, we discussed the matter of going remote. 
And we were so well prepared to go remote that when the shutdown for COVID happened, we were the first city ready to go because we had already talked about how to purchase equipment and, and what the uh, protocols would be. So um, I think that's just an example of how we can work together. Yes, may there be differences of opinion? Of course, this is the democratic process, but the democratic process also calls for uh, in each governing body to have a majority uh, in consensus to move forward. And I do believe that there is matters that are of great importance to our community that have been delayed because of the delay of this uh, retreat that have not yet been addressed. I mean, additional revenue of um, additional sources of revenue for our city. Um, you know, TOT, we've talked a lot about that and we've delayed that discussion for quite some time. I also believe that we should revisit our, our city council policies and procedures because, you know, frankly, they're a little bit outdated. I don't think even like their gender, um, uh, you know, specific or aware at all where, you know, a council woman isn't even mentioned in them. So that being said, um, I know that at least for me, a working a uh, person that has to well in advance make arrangements to get the time off from my day job, right? Like we all, most of us work a full-time job uh, outside of council. Uh, I, I absolutely support moving forward with the date that we had all agreed to um, come together and have these discussions. And like I mentioned, I don't see the need for a facilitator and much less a need um, uh, for us to have to expand the public's uh, you know, resources and funding on, on a facilitator if we can have a candidate and open discussion. So I would not be supportive of a facilitator and I um, move to have it uh, move forward on Monday, September 20th. Would you mind if Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs spoke? Council Member Jerry? Mr. Mayor, you're the chair of this council. That's okay. your prerogative. You're making a motion, so I wasn't clear if you that was okay if we would let him speak. Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs, would you like to speak? Yes, uh, I would. Um, I, I've served over my blessed long life on all kinds of different boards and different organizations that have uh, utilized the retreat process to do strategic planning, to resolve conflicts, to decide on goals and objectives and mission statements, uh, et cetera. And in every situation, somebody needs to facilitate. Uh, I have been a facilitator in, in some of those, uh, you know, uh, strategic planning sessions at, at, at UC San Diego. Um, and often uh, an external facilitator is brought in when there are contentious issues because that everybody can see that person as neutral uh, and not involved in the consequences of whatever the decisions are. Um, and, and there's a big value there. Now, a, a lot of this depends on what are the topics and what are the outcomes that we want and what kind of support do we need to get to those outcomes. And as council member Gary, I think um, very well articulated, um, there's really two different kinds of outcomes. One are sort of objective policy kinds of outcomes. Uh, do, we, do we look at different taxation or, uh, or revenue generating options and what are they and fleshing those out? And the other is internal procedures, uh, including how items get on the agenda, uh, the relative roles of the mayor and the council members and the city manager uh, Etc. The tougher issues are the latter. They have plagued the council for two generations of mayors, and they are now at the point where, uh, from my uh, observation, uh, we need some resolution on these internal procedures and rules in order for us to uh, better serve our community. Um, I don't want to go into it very much right now, but I can tell you that that kind of discussion with the different views that are involved requires a facilitator if it's going to come out productively. Um, 
So I would say we need to have a facilitator for the procedural issues, even though they may seem mundane, they are not. They involve, essentially they involve power and who has it within this city government and power sharing and um, roles and responsibilities. And this is major stuff. We, we've kind of swept it aside and kept it under the rug, but it no longer can be uh, managed by avoidance because the well-being of our operations and I would dare say the, um, uh, the well-being of our city manager who's in the middle of all this is at stake. I'm being obviously dead serious here. So for one of us to be the facilitator or for the city manager or the assistant city manager to be a facilitator on those items is a non-starter. It's not going to have an outcome that we want. A facilitator would need to be somebody, and the mayor has suggested someone who facilitated the the uh, San Diego uh, Power JPA, uh, who he, you know he doesn't know in person, but uh, the city manager is has done some background in, uh, on that, and this is an excellent person. Um, that person or someone else would interview each of us, get our perspectives, formulate a way to move the meeting forward so that all the perspectives could be heard in a safe environment and have an opportunity to reach some outcomes that are win-win-win outcomes. Uh, you just don't do that spontaneously in this kind of a charged uh, environment. So I think that part of it definitely needs facilitation. Um, the other issues, I can tell you from my first four years on the city council, when uh, Jim Janney was mayor uh, and before Andy Hall was city manager, we dealt with a lot of these revenue economic development issues in retreats. I mean, in workshops. Uh, three times a year, there's an extra week, and we would take that extra week uh, to do a workshop on economic development, whatever, have South County EDC or a panel of experts or whatever, um, help us think through opportunities. And we'd have good discussions and the community would be there. I really think that that's a good environment and a good way to handle the the revenue issues, not just amongst ourselves, but relying also on some external expertise. We don't need a facilitator for that. But the mayor can run that meeting. The city manager can run that meeting. Any of us can run that kind of a meeting. We're talking about facts, information, options, best practices in the objective realm of revenue and policies, et cetera. Uh, but if we do it Monday, we're going to be doing it without any external input regarding best practices, options, what the city has done with TOT, uh, whatever. So I think that either way we go, it needs to be more thoughtfully planned in terms of what the agenda is and what help we need, whether it's expertise or facilitation, uh, to really come out of it in a manner that moves us forward as a council and a community. So um, I understand, <laughs> and I'm just as upset as everybody else, so we keep postponing it. Uh, but let's do it well, rather than do it just because we postponed it and we need to, we need to get it over with, right? <laughs> we need to have it. We want to have, we want to have a retreat that is going to be a positive thing where we can all walk out of it feeling good that we've done something. We don't want to have chaos right? Or just a lot of talk and no real substance, if it's the economic types of issues. So th those are my thoughts. I think, I think we, what we need to do is 
uh, advise the city manager what kind of a retreat we want, what's, which issues, the sort of policy and economic issues or the procedural issues, and set up different sessions for each of those that will give us, you know, value added and move us forward in a major way, not just another meeting or another discussion. So those are my thoughts. Any uh, response to that, anybody? I'd like to hear your thoughts, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, you know, I, I first went to a facilitated meeting at the city of Imperial Beach. I think I was 21. That must have been back in the uh, in the 80s. Um, so I, you know, my my experience with the city, our first retreat um, that I att attended as as the mayor, um, that Councilmember Spriggs was there. I guess it was 2015. Was facilitated. I was actually strongly in support of not having our city manager and assistant city manager facilitate future retreats. As uh, someone who works in organizational development and management, as does our city council member Aguirre, who works for a foundation that facilitates meetings that I attend. Um, the foundation facilitates meetings that I attend. I've been at those meetings for 20 years. Um, I find it ironic that we had a union member, uh, David Garcia, who represents the SIU, asked for a seat at the table. Unions specifically developed in this country to facilitate and make sure that the rights of workers were protected. They're, they're, they're that outside facilitator that actually works to, to, to be a facilitator, right? So that you get someone from the outside, so that relationship between boss and worker is sort of like, you know, there's some space there. So, you know, it's not as if this is something that we're doing new. Um, Lisa Gordon would be the first, would be the first black women owned business that the city of Imperial Beach contracts with in its 60 year history, which I thought was interesting. But she's worked for San Diego Community Power, uh, Sandag, uh, a number of different agencies. So she seems to be the top person in her field. So um, I like to go with best practices. I completely agree with every single word that council member Spriggs uh, has said he's got seniority on this council in terms of uh, just in terms of outcome and, and process. Um, Monday is pretty soon. I, and, and just to be honest, I spent a lot of time talking to our residents, uh, usually at grocery outlet and CVS and the pier uh, on the street. For them, there's a housing crisis. There's a garbage crisis. There's a, a homeless crisis. There's a sewage crisis. Um, there's a wildfire crisis, there's a COVID crisis. No one's ever told me there's an agenda crisis or there's a, 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 a retreat crisis. No one said that they were dying to, to make sure they had a retreat sooner than later. So I think the retreat was, was being postponed because I think the idea was that it was always gonna be in person and it wasn't in person and then the, you know things keep changing. So that's just my feedback. I, I like pursuing best management practices I insisted that the first retreat that we had when I was elected mayor was facilitated. Again, I was against not having them facilitated. I think it sets a bad precedent. I agree with our, my colleague, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs, that uh, having an outside facilitator is what results in a better process. Um, you know, we have funds to pay for it. We have had in the past. And again, I do remember one of my first meetings being really surprised at how, when I was back at 21 and got involved in city politics, as a member of the Thailand's advisory committee that, you know, having a facilitator really made things better in a time when things were really contentious in the city. So that's my feedback. You know, I, 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 oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Councilwoman Lafoma. Thank you, Councilmember Fisher. Um, can I just uh, comment on those comments? Uh, you know, well, first and foremost, Mr. Mayor, thank you for raising the point of a housing crisis and, and the feedback that you hear uh, that is very similar to what I hear uh, constantly when it comes to uh, especially housing issues. Um, so thank you for acknowledging that. Uh, I, I want to um, respectfully acknowledge and, 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 and say that I hear you both and, you know, I acknowledge your points, uh, but I respectfully disagree. I think that we should move forward uh, without a facilitator and then, you know, if things get contentious on a certain particular item, then then maybe we can consider that. But I, I would be, again, uh, supportive of uh, the motion I made and would 
um, after Councilmember Fisher is comment, call the question. Yeah, That's you know, I, oh, I just, I'm, I'm just curious because, you know, we've been planning this retreat for seven months and a week before the retreat, we're now discussing whether or not we need a mediator. It sounds like a couple of my co colleagues here felt like they, we should always have had a mediator. And my understanding is we can have as many retreats as we need to. And my understanding is also that uh, in the last six years, we've only had uh, one retreat that had a mediator. Am I, am I correct in those, uh, Mayor and, and Mayor Pro Temp Spriggs? You've been here longest I would imagine you could answer that for me that sounds about right but that's not necessarily a good thing yeah I wouldn't uh, say I, best practices worst management practice or something where it continued I I I, I, uh, I know that I objected to it but uh, deferred to the city manager I regret that having done that well you know you know I just think it's strange that all of a sudden we've, we've got some things we'd like to talk about and a couple of new council members you know, we, we're not sure what to expect, but all of a sudden the brakes get put on. And I, I just don't, I don't understand the timing of this discussion. I would rather have had this discussion back in February. Um, maybe, maybe some things didn't come out till recent events, but again, you know, I, I, I'm listening to the best practice is to have a mediator and not, we, there's not been one in, you know, 75 months. So I, I just, I'm just, I just can't understand why all of a sudden this is it. You know, if there's if there's some, you know, topics that we want to discuss that somebody's not crazy about, well, you know what? This is why we're on a council. We work together, and and I think that you know we we need to learn how to work together. Will a facilitator help that? Could be, but I think we've tackled plenty of hard issues before, and I, I would appreciate the opportunity to to move forward with that one at this time. Well, I'll answer that. I mean, I'd be honest. I, I think, at least from what I hear behind the scenes, um, and I'm making sure that we're transparent to the public, this may be the most acrimonious and conflict-ridden council I've worked with in eight years. Um, I know that I've been uncomfortable with some of the, the language and behavior directed at our city manager, where he's been blamed for not advancing the political agendas of certain council members. Um, I'm concerned about that. I, and that's why I raised the issue actually months ago about having a facilitator. I didn't know there was a, a strategic planning crisis. Again, I, I think I raised the housing crisis pretty much every time we talk. Um, if we could have a meeting tomorrow on Monday and then magically build housing, I think that would be great. Again, I answer to the people and the people tell me um, what crisis we're dealing with, and none of them has been the uh, agenda crisis or the strategic lack of strategic retreat crisis. So maybe you guys are hanging out somewhere different than me, but IV is a little bit different. Um, we're not asking for anything magic, just a facilitator, something that's standard practice in pretty much every public agency in the United States. It's something that we've had a long history of doing in Imperial Beach, and. Again, like I said, we regret not doing, at least me, uh, doing in past retreats because I think facilitators are much more effective at managing outcomes. But, you know, this council needs to do what it needs to do. But um, I'm going to ask the public to attend and, and monitor this, this, this retreat and participate as well. I think I get concerned that the council is moving towards having an unplanned, unagendized retreat on Monday. Um, and expecting the city council or city or city manager who's been subject to vitriol and belittling and anger on the half of city council members behind the scenes um, because they haven't adopted their own narrow political ideological agendas. Um, I'm concerned about that. Mr. So, Mayor, if I may call a point of decorum, Mr. The Mayor, community. may I call a point of decorum? I, I think as, as a chair of this council, I would ask that you fulfill your duty as a chair of this council and not attack our uh, colleagues or question our colleagues integrity or behavior the matter at hand is an item of discussion we should focus on that well i think it is driven i think that's exactly why i've requested a i think the, the what i've heard happen behind the scenes is unacceptable um i think it's why we need a facilitator 
Um, and I think it's behavior that I haven't seen in, in, in the eight years that I've been married until recently. And I, I think it's, it's something we should discuss openly and transparently, not in a, a secret retreat that the public doesn't attend. Um, I think this council is in a rush to have a, a, a retreat. I think we have to have an open and transparent discussion of everything. I think that's very, very important. Well, Mr. all Aaron, of our, I'll all clarify, of our meetings I'll just are clarify. open. I'm so sorry, Mr. Spriggs. I, I just add, I'll just clarify that this is not a rushed or secret retreat. Staff is ready to go. Mr. Hall, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I had to get are unmuted. We, are you, do you have a staff report and presentation ready to go for Monday? Um, yeah, I've been preparing uh, just in case. Absolutely. I need to be prepared for whatever decision the council Wonderful. makes. Thank you. Okay. Can, can, can I... Uh... Can I speak for a second? Sure. Um, respectfully, Mayor, um, your prior term, this is the first uh, year where district elections took place. So it's very important that you understand that you have two individuals that are on the council that are working class. We represent those hardworking individuals that are in the prospective districts. So it's very important that we express our concerns and we are the voice of those individuals. Um, myself and Jack, we we are of the type where we wanna get things done in a productive manner. Uh, we don't wanna keep pushing things back. Um, it, it's time for us to have this. Let's hash it out. Um, I'll buy lunch for everyone, show up, I'll feed everyone, let's break bread. Um, and I wanna second that motion for Councilwoman Paloma. I second her motion. Let me just add one further item of discussion, uh, since we can always still continue with discussion after a motion is made and seconded. Um, I always report on the work of the, um, the sea level rise working group between which has representatives, three representatives from cities, three from counties, and uh, several from the coastal California Coastal Commission. Those discussions have only progressed because, and they're every month because there is an outstanding facilitator that uh, keeps the discussions positive because we have very opposing viewpoints, local governments versus the Coastal Commission. Any of you who follow the stuff that goes on in California know that. Um, and they serve the role of, of working out an agreed agenda uh, and managing the discussion so that things keep moving forward. And because we have periodic meetings, they do the notes and the do and, and do draft documents representing areas of agreement and that sort of thing that everybody can comment on and move forward. That's a different process, but um, facilitation is the thing that makes it work. So I would, I would just urge us, if we're going to go ahead Monday, and because we just don't know what we don't know, I would urge us to, to stay with the policy and, and revenue issues on Monday and have a later meeting that's facilitated, a later retreat that's facilitated that deals with the internal, um, the internal issues of how we work together, how we get agenda items on, the relative responsibilities of the mayor and council members uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, I can just tell you that that's, you know, if you want to go ahead and do it Monday, fine, but uh, it's going to be a more difficult discussion than if it was facilitated. And it, and all of our meetings by the Brown Act are open to the public. So there's, there's really no question about that. Although it would be difficult to carry on the kind of discussion that we need to have uh, in the public realm, it would be much better if it was closed session, because you know when we talk about legal and other issues in closed session, it's a much more spontaneous discussion. But that's not what we're going to be able to do with this uh, with this retreat. It'll it'll be a public meeting. But I ask that we don't deal with the internal issues because uh, of procedure, because underlying those procedural issues 
are serious discussions about power, roles, and responsibilities that uh, I, I, I think a facilitator would be very much useful in helping us work through them to, to some positive conclusions. You know, respectfully, I would just say that when you talk about, you know, talking about gen items, stuff like that, we have a municipal the municipal code that's pretty well thought out and very clear. And what we've happened, we've got past the, the neutral part of allowing the codes to run how they are supposed to do it. And I think that's where we need to get back to that. And if anybody objects to our municipal codes and adhering to them, I think that perhaps that may be an issue. Um, I don't think we're starting from scratch. We have plenty of documents. We have pages of municipal code that clearly outline the mayor's responsibilities as a member of the city council, which he is, and the rest of the city council members. So I think that we can have a harmonious discussion about getting back to where we need to be. This is all it's all about. We're not creating anything new. We may come to the conclusion that we do need to adjust the municipal code like council member Gary mentioned to, for some correct language, but I think it's been pretty well uh, thought out by our predecessors and what we do going forward will help those who are in future councils. And, you know, that's where I want to make sure we understand that it's not that they have the city council and the mayor, we have the mayor as part of the city council that has some specific roles, which again are very clearly outlined in our municipal code. And I think that while we're asking to is have a discussion about that and how to get back to where we should have been based on the municipal codes. So just to be clear, we're gonna go through the entire municipal code on Monday, is that is that correct? Sure, if, if you're not clear on that, I can forward it to you and we can discuss it as a council, but I think it's pretty clear. It only took about, take me maybe a minute to read. So if we need to, we I'd happy to go through it. You mean the entire municipal code of the city? Uh, no, just the ones in question of about the responsibility of council members and the mayor as uh, Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs had, had suggested. Mr. Mayor, I had called the question. Are we taking a vote? There is a motion on the floor. It was seconded, so I'm asking, are we taking a vote? I, I second that motion. Could you repeat the motion, please? I moved to host our city council retreat on September 20th at the time that we had all agreed and scheduled. And I also moved to not uh, have the need to hire a facilitator for said retreat and that we have a general discussion first and foremost about our policies, uh, our council's policies and procedures and additional sources of revenue. I second that motion. Clerk. Yes, there has been a motion by Aguirre, second by Leba Gonzalez, to proceed with a workshop on Monday. Um, let me get the date. Monday, sorry. I want to make sure I have the date. Monday, August, or September 20th, uh, without a facilitator for a general discussion on council policies and revenue. Councilwoman Aguirre, how do you vote? Aguirre, aye. Councilmember Leba Gonzalez, how do you vote? Leba Gonzalez, aye. Councilmember Fisher, how do you vote? Fisher, aye. Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs, how do you vote? Spriggs, no. Mayor Dedina, how do you vote? Dedina, no. Motion carried by the following votes. Ayes, Councilmember Aguirre, Councilmember Leba Gonzalez, Councilmember Fisher, noes, Mayor Pro Tem Spriggs, and Mayor Dedina. Not a good way to go into a retreat. Um, I'll just add to that that this, this you know, we uh, are on the same we're, team. We're, as far as we know, we've, we've moved forward and uh, City Council meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>